Pakistan is in trouble. It seems to be facing one crisis after the next. It's one of the world's most populous countries, and its problems have an impact way beyond its borders. And that's something that should concern us all. We're going to look in detail at some of the different crises that Pakistan is dealing with. We also want to find possible solutions. And to do that, we're talking to some of the most prominent voices on Pakistan for their views on what's wrong and what should be done to set Pakistan up for a better future. There's an economic crisis. Prices are skyrocketing. Even well-off people are struggling to pay their bills. We are sitting on a border gap and the situation can explode any time. There's a political crisis. Pakistan is a fragile democracy that's constantly subjected to meddling by the military. The acceptability of martial law is just zero in this country now. Military controls everything. It is now taking decisions of what political parties will survive. Either politicians have to figure out a way to work with the military or the military has to give up on intervening in politics. There's also a security crisis which is nothing new in Pakistan, but it's gotten worse since the Taliban takeover in Afghanistan. Pakistan really does not have much of a plan for countering this, uh, this growing terrorism threat. And all of these problems are leading to a brain drain. Educated young people, desperate for opportunity, are going elsewhere. There are few reasons to stay in Pakistan for a lot of young Pakistanis. I think at this point in time, the biggest fear is that uh, we might be on a break of state. Yeah. How did things get to a point where right now, this is a real question that people are talking about, even searching on the internet. Is Pakistan becoming a failed state? Several crises have come together to make this a very difficult moment. First, let's start with the economic crisis, the one that's affecting most people's lives right now. Prices are going up for electricity, fuel, and food. But incomes are not, and people can't pay their bills. <laughs> So why is the economy such a mess? And what's the fix? To figure that out, let's first look at what's causing the crisis. The reason is that Pakistan imports far more than it exports. And it's fuel imports in particular that are hurting Pakistan especially since Russia's invasion of Ukraine in 2022, when oil prices shot up worldwide. In Pakistan, paying for more expensive oil imports took a much larger chunk of foreign currency reserves, which started to run out. Within months, Pakistan, already carrying tremendous external debt, risked default. So in June 2023, after lengthy negotiations, Pakistan signed another $3 billion bailout from the International Monetary Fund. To qualify, it had to cut government fuel subsidies. Electricity and fuel prices suddenly shot up. And that's draining household budgets, which is really worrying. Conditions are only going to become worse. The IMF program requires the government to make even more policy changes, which are bound to be unpopular and exact a heavy blow on the common man. The World Bank says 4 million Pakistanis are expected to fall below the poverty line just this year. Things are so bad, many of the brightest young minds are heading for the exits. Everything is going up to the roof. Authorities in Pakistan have arrested 10 alleged human traffickers. Traffickers who use this crisis as an opportunity. Hundreds of Pakistanis who paid for help to reach Europe drowned off the coast of Greece in June. Desperation is growing. People need relief. So how is Pakistan addressing this economic emergency? We are seeing the, the Pakistani state do what it always does when it has a significant economic crisis, and that's look for support for bailout funding from those outside, and you know, certainly the IMF. Besides the IMF bailout, Pakistan's asking other richer nations for help. It's now set up what's called a Special Investment Facilitation Council. And get this, it's not headed by a politician or economic expert. The country's military leadership is front and center, courting investors from the Gulf states. But what's their pitch? Because Pakistan currently offers little to inspire investor confidence. Investment does not come in vacuum. It only appears your, your economy is, is strong. Uh, then, uh, then the investor will also be tempted to come here. But we have never seen that the investors going to a country which is not everything, uh, the collapsing economy. 
now even saudi arabia is saying openly that it's not going to give any more free money no more bailouts no more interest free loans now they want to do investments they want to do joint ventures with the economy on life support outside help is seen by many as just another stopgap what's needed is a major economic overhaul Pakistan needs to start trading with its neighbors including India. Pakistan also needs a more educated, uh, better trained workforce. Pakistan needs to look forward to high tech uh, investment. All of those things require policies on the one hand and patience on the other side. But time is a luxury millions in Pakistan don't have. They need relief right now. And that brings us to the next crisis. Pakistan's political crisis. What we're seeing right now is the results of a power struggle. You might know this guy, Imran Khan. Four years ago, the former cricket star and the party he founded, Pakistan Tehreek-e-Insaf, or Movement for Justice, rose to power on such promises. Pakistan ko aise chalayenge jo kabi Pakistan pehle nahi chalaya gaya. Wo governance denge jo kabi Pakistan mein pehle aisi governance nahi aayi. His message caught fire with a new generation of supporters. Starting out, he also had the backing of the military. For many, he seemed like a political messiah, especially among the urban middle class. But critics wondered if he could deliver on his promises. There's always a question mark exactly how popular he is, because one should remember that uh, till 2011, he was just a one-man party who was popular as a former superstar and was a popular because uh, he was always on television. and then suddenly the military machinery and the state machinery was used to sort of hype his uh his popularity but their mutual admiration eventually soured imran khan became too big for his boots from the military's point of view meri awam faisla kare ki is mulk ki qiyadat kaun karega na washington kare they disapproved of his anti-western rhetoric and overtures to russia during the outbreak of the ukraine war The final straw was Hans Clash with then Army Chief General Bajwa reportedly over military appointments. In April 2022 he was ousted in a no confidence vote. The resolution for vote of no confidence against Mr Imran Khan has been passed by a majority. But Hans refused to leave quietly. He launched a comeback campaign, street marches to demand early elections. But all this noise was eventually met with a violent crackdown. It's believed the military is trying to extinguish the political supernova it helped create. Khan faces hundreds of charges including terrorism, corruption and blasphemy, which he denies. He was given so much power that whole structure I'm talking about, the judiciary, the media, everybody facilitating him. And uh, they continue to do that and they are still doing it even after he was ousted. And this is the structure which the military is now trying to break. But let's just rewind a bit. To understand why Hans Riff with the military led to his downfall, you need to take a look at Pakistan's history. Pakistan was founded as a democracy in 1947, but it's also seen several decades of direct military rule. When there are civilian governments, the military is always driving from the back seat. No single prime minister has ever completed a full 5-year term, though many came from famous political dynasties that controlled the two major political parties. the Pakistan People's Party or PPP and the Pakistan Muslim League or PMLN when the military decided the civilians had messed up it stepped in and seized power it's been nearly 25 years since Pakistan's last military dictator Pervez Musharraf overthrew an elected government over time Pakistan's developed into what it is now a hybrid regime hybridity is in Pakistan's terms a military government with a civilian face so civilians justifying military's governance and providing a face to mili- military's govern control of governance when we talk about the reach of pakistan's military it's more than just politics and defense the military is a vast economic enterprise with commercial assets estimated to be worth more than 20 billion us dollars interests that drive its agenda and steamroll over others to the extent that the US and other countries are keen to continue their relationships with Pakistan which i think they are albeit on modest levels they want to ensure that they continue to have workable relations with the military because it continues to be seen as as a critical if not the most critical political stakeholder which 
you know, I emphasize, um, is not good for democracy. So not good for democracy. That's apparent with the political turmoil that's followed Imran Khan's ouster. But given the military's grip on Pakistan, it doesn't look like the hybrid regime model is going away. So who could be the face of Pakistan's next elected government? Imran Khan doesn't count himself out despite his legal troubles. Other options hail once again from political dynasties. Three-time Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif could return. His brother Shabazz Sharif might try for a second term as Prime Minister. Or a new generation could make a debut. Nawaz's daughter, Maryam Nawaz. Balawo Bhutto Zardari, son of assassinated Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto from the PPP, is also waiting in the wings. I think for the moment it seems that the military is uh, quite content with uh, having people in office who do not bring much public support uh, with them, but are totally dependent on the military so that they will not do anything that the military does not approve of. So what will it take to solve Pakistan's chronic political instability? Pakistan's major problem is apart from other issues, is that uh, but we, uh, over the years, because of the military's control, our military shadow, uh, democratic institutions have, have not been allowed to uh, to strengthen. I'd be dreaming as a Pakistani if I say that tomorrow there'll be elections and there'll be a better controlled military out there. No, this is not going to happen. It has to happen progressively through negotiations. We need elections that are free and fair. We need elections that are considered legitimate in the eyes of a majority of Pakistanis or the political crisis the, and the economic stability that it comes with this Burma political crisis will endure. On top of the economic and political crises we've talked about, there's also a third crisis Pakistan is facing, a security crisis. Look where Pakistan sits. To the east, its historic rival India, led by a Hindu nationalist government. And to the west, Afghanistan, where the Taliban now rules. For decades, Pakistan was a key backer in the Taliban's war against the US military, a decision that has come back to bite Pakistan. In particular, the Pakistani military is concerned that the Afghan Taliban is now providing a safe haven to their brothers in arms, the Pakistani Taliban, whose stated purpose is to destroy the Pakistani state and implement Sharia rule. Since the Americans withdrew from Afghanistan, there's been a surge in terror attacks on civilians and Pakistani security forces. It's a tense moment. I mean, um, every second day, uh, lives are being lost by the by by the army, which is not fair on these brave soldiers who are fighting to suffer at the hands of problematic policy. And for years, I mean, for decades, Pakistan military has supported the Taliban. Now, the Pakistani military wants the Afghan Taliban to restrain the Pakistani Taliban. At least more than 200, 300 Pakistani soldiers have been killed and terrorists attacked by the TTP. And in fact, uh, we have not seen any sign of Afghan Taliban putting any pressure on that. It's unlikely that the that Afghan Taliban will respond on a scale um, that satisfied Pakistan, right? The military is so concerned it's carried out airstrikes on the Pakistani Taliban inside Afghanistan, but it's a dangerous tactic. They can't go and attack targets across the border. You know, then the threat is going to really get out of control. So how they're managing it is basically through talks and more talks. Fears are growing that if something isn't done, things are going to go from bad to worse because there are reports of other militant groups, so-called Islamic State and Al-Qaeda in the region. Potential for revival of Islamist extremism and terrorism uh, as it existed before 9-11 is significant and should not be ignored. So what options does Pakistan have? Either it can do the more modest uh, option, and that would be to try to fortify border security, or it could actually launch a full-scale counterterrorism offensive. But that would cost a lot at a moment when its economy is is really suffering, and it could risk um, deeper tensions per and perhaps even the risk of conflict with the Taliban in Afghanistan. Okay, let's just pause on that thought. There's conflict brewing, and it's the military that will determine the response, not a civilian-led government. That's the hybrid regime at play, and we're seeing that elsewhere in Pakistan's foreign policy. The military agenda is what trumps all other considerations. And nowhere is that more apparent than to the east, Pakistan's border with its, up till now, permanent enemy, India. 
At the center of this conflict, the disputed Kashmir region, which both Pakistan and India claim. Meanwhile, the world around Pakistan is changing, with superpowers like the US, China, and Russia competing for influence. And the West especially is taking a new shine to India. Compared to Pakistan, India's profile has always been uh, rising, has always been ahead because of their vastness, their vastness of population, and the fact that uh, India became a democracy and we couldn't become a democracy. The surge in US military support to India is of course adding to New Delhi's advantage in conventional military power over Islamabad and this will intensify long-standing worries in Pakistan. And it's a threat that's very real, and that's of global importance. India and Pakistan are two nuclear-armed countries that have already fought four wars. Pakistan reportedly has a stockpile of 170 nuclear warheads, India 164. And what stopped them from using nuclear weapons so far is the threat of mutually assured destruction. There's hardly a way that a Indian nuclear weapon can be dropped on, say, the Pakistani city of Lahore without the nuclear fallout coming into Delhi or a Pakistani nuclear weapon hits Delhi without nuclear fallout coming into into Lahore. Pakistan's army, whatever one might criticize, whatever else one might criticize it for, is a responsible institution in that sense. And I think so are India's leaders. Even the most unlikely, unfathomable scenarios cannot be completely ruled out, especially when you have two nuclear armed countries that you know have been willing to fight against each other, even if in limited fashion. So why can't the two sides get over this rivalry and mend fences? A thaw likely won't play well on either side of the border, with Narendra Modi's hold on power fueled by Hindu nationalism, and Pakistan's core identity as a Muslim nation. But for Pakistan, there could be a load of advantages to pursuing peace with India. From Pakistan's perspective, it would make sense to try and change Pakistani public opinion, which still remains very negative about India, and persuade people to understand that uh, even if people have bad memories going back all the way to partition and to the several wars that the two countries have had, they have no choice but to negotiate, to trade, and to open people-to-people -people relations. There is tremendous potential for trade between India and Pakistan. Speaking of tremendous potential for trade, to the Northeast lies China, a rising world superpower and Pakistan's richest neighbor. China wants energy and it wants to transport that energy through Pakistan. It's a huge opportunity, but it's fraught with complications. Beijing has already spent lavishly on the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, known as CPEC. That's a 3,000-kilometer transport network that aims to connect China's Xinjiang province to Pakistan's Gwadar port on the Arabian Sea. For Pakistan, CPEC has the potential to unlock upwards of 65 billion U.S. dollars in investment and millions of jobs. But progress on the 10-year-old project has been slow. Those potential rewards remain locked up. China's uh, debt has become a burden on Pakistan, and CPEC has not yet uh, uh, become sufficiently productive to uh, justify. China also has doubts over Pakistan's security after terror attacks targeting Chinese nationals working on the project. Doubts and delays could lead to concessions, even the presence of Chinese security forces on Pakistani soil. This is Beijing, so I think that Pakistan may be willing to give, give a free pass, but not necessarily the public, which I think would be very concerned about this idea of, uh, of a Chinese security presence on its soil, even if it's a Chinese ally. I think it would also be, from an optics perspective, an embarrassment for the Pakistani security establishment, because it would essentially be an acknowledgement on China's part that it doesn't trust Pakistan to protect but could CPEC eventually pay off for Pakistan? Pakistan needs to expand. It has to get into high-tech um, industries. It has to get into uh, uh, manufacturing in a significant way. And if it does that, then this infrastructure that the Chinese have built will definitely come in handy. It will be useful, but it will only be useful, as I said, once there is an industry and there is an export it's to China's advantage to have a stable Pakistan, both politically and economically. But CPEC's troubles show once again just what a struggle it is to reap benefits from foreign investment in Pakistan. Well, we've looked at Pakistan's economic, political and security crises. 
Something else is going on in the background of all of this. Pakistan's climate change crisis. Glaciers are melting, extreme heat is baking cities and crops, and millions of people are vulnerable to flooding. Coping with climate change, a weak economy, political instability and security are all complex problems, not easily solved, but that doesn't mean they can't be. So what will put Pakistan on a better path for the future? Let's give the last word to our experts. We need a strong and viable economy to bolster our security. We cannot rely on the military alone. There should be a dialogue among the political parties and to dialogue about how to strengthen the democratic institution. The problem right now with Pakistani politicians is that they want negotiations which result in one of them coming into power. They're not creating strong uh, infrastructure to deal with the military. And this is what they should be working on. Simple. I've always said that. You have to relook at a constitution and the nature of a democracy. You have to reform it radically. What Pakistan needs to do is fortify its, uh, its border, try to step up border security to reduce the likelihood of these militants coming across the border uh, into Pakistan. There needs to be a new foreign policy that engages all of Pakistan's neighbors uh, as economic partners rather than as enemies. Pakistan needs to stop thinking of itself as a warrior nation, think of itself as a trading nation. So what do you think? How would you fix Pakistan's problems? Let us know in the comments so we can keep the conversation going.